way. We welcome you. We welcome Steve. And uh, I'm just so grateful that we have friends and people that we can call on at the last minute. And, and I am super grateful, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, I am the pastor here at Gold Hill, but I will not be preaching this morning. If uh, you are joining us for the first time online, if you would please leave your um, where you are from and how we best can pray for you. And I got a message from my niece about Graham. And um, <clears throat> she asked... Well, she's, it's been a year. It's been a year. We've been praying for Graham for a year. And she said, I am weary of this fight, and I'm not feeling strong enough. Please say an extra prayer for Graham, as he is also tired and feeling warm, worn out himself. He had chemo Monday, and he will be having uh, another chemo this week. So they are tired. If you have been a caretaker for anyone or if you have been with anyone that's gone through this, you, you know how weary uh, it can make you just every day one more thing, it seems like. So um, anyway, if we could keep Graham in our prayers. And uh, Lindsay is doing okay. She is She's not sleeping well, and because she's not sleeping well, I think that she, um, she, she's, she's also a little weary. She's, she's not pushing through this as, as we would love to see her do, uh, but, but there will be an end. I, I, I feel like she needs at least two weeks to get back to herself. You can't just have that kind of major surgery and bounce right back into the world. Um, so are there other prayer requests that are not in the bulletin? Praise reports. I'm a little worried about Hoppy. They didn't come last week, and Vivian said they were a little under the weather, and I've not heard back. Um, I know that she had told me a few weeks ago that Hoppy was getting tired, and um, I'm hoping that his cancer has not come back, but, but we don't know. Um, I had something I wanted to say and it just left my head. So are there any uh, announcements that we need? I know that the, the Halloween thing and then the back in time, which I said I'd have in the bulletin and I did not. I got sick, Darius. I need an excuse. I'm turning in my excuse for, to the teacher. I got, I got sick. I didn't get the bulletin done very well. Um, what is the date of that? It's next, uh, next Saturday. Next Saturday, the fall back in time. Okay. So if everybody would just mark their calendar for next Saturday is the fall back in time. And I apologize. I didn't have that in the bulletin today. And then we have homecoming. And... Um, for our visitors and new people, homecoming is always at 11 o'clock because it's like it used to be 30 years ago. I don't know if that'll change or not. So um, Glenn Myers, who uh, started his, this was I think one of his And he also served at Epworth. And when I was in deaf ministry, he was a strong supporter of mine. And he had me to speak at Epworth for deaf ministry. So um, I love Glenn and Susan. And um, I hope that we will have a good crowd. Pass the word that we have homecoming next Sunday at 11 o'clock. And... Um, Pam and Melissa, it just might be the three of us setting up for homecoming next week. We, we need to grab Jan before she gets out of here today to get instructions on what to do. Um, so uh, those are the only announcements that I have. Are there any other announcements? Um, So 
So if we get 50 more dollars, we will have $500. So anybody that feels like they've got $50 burning a hole in their pocket that they need to spend on a good cause, give Bill a check for $50 and we will once again go over our uh, goal. Our goal was 300 so this would be great if we could go over our goal because things are costing so much more than they ever did before and, and the folks that use the food pantry, the, you know, it's going up for them too. And their, and their salary is not going up. So this, this is really important right now that um, we're able to help the people that are, that are unable to help themselves during this time. Any other announcements? And I can't, I'm, I'm going to remember what I wanted to say in about 10 minutes. And so right in the middle of some, you know, right in the middle of scripture, I may just give an announcement or whatever it is I can't remember. So, so just, just beware of that. And those of y'all that are just coming, uh, I do that, not in the middle of scripture, but I do that at, at inappropriate times sometimes give announcements that I, I have forgotten. So if you are able, will you uh, stand and open your hymn books to 174 for our call to worship. Scripture is coming from Luke chapter 10. I will be reading 38 through 42. And I know some of you carry your Bible on your phone, and that is okay to go ahead and open up your Bible app. Jesus visits with Martha and Mary. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and she asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. If you would um, turn to page 881, and we, our affirmation of faith will be our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of
watershed so that people that are not here on Sunday morning or just don't have a church family can ask us to pray for them. And uh, we got the, this, this is a week of happy prayers. One's, one is a little um, serious, but I love the first one that was given to me. Easton pulled them out of the prayer box, and I do love this one. It just simply says, God is good. Now, who can relate to that? Raise your hands and say, Amen. That is an Amen moment. God is good. And the second prayer is um, for the United Methodist Church and for its unity in Jesus Christ for all the people. And then it says, love y'all. So this is definitely somebody from the South. So, so we are, we are going to pray over these. Father God, you know the hearts that stopped and took the time to ask us to pray for what was heavy on their hearts. And we honor these prayers by lifting them up to you, Father. I ask uh, also for unity in this church. And if that cannot happen, at least have a graceful and gracious um, split of our United Methodist Church. And, and that's so hard to say. Uh, especially those of us that have been Methodist and United Methodist all of our life. But this is a serious prayer, Father, and we do take it very serious, and we pray it every day. And Father, I just love and appreciate when people just want to stop by and lift your praises, and we do praise you. You are a good, good God. And we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for caring for us, and we know that if we put all of our church business into your hands, you will take everything and work out what was meant for evil for good. And so we are just trusting you with this issue in our church these days. And all of God's people said, Amen. And if you would, join me in uh, our prayers for all the people. Dear Lord, we love to start our prayer time out by remembering those that are not with us, those that leave prayers in the prayer shed. We lift up your holy name, and we ask that you anoint those that are sick today, those that are out of town today, those that had conflicts and were not able to join us, we are missing many, many faces this morning. And we hope that they know we miss them and we love them. And Lord, we, we don't know the stories behind the faces, all the faces that are missing, but you do. So God, we just ask that you bless them and you um, keep them safe. And we ask that uh, if there is something that we need to know or to do, please in, inform us so that uh, we can be your hands and feet to those that we are missing this morning. And Lord, we thank you that some people just want to praise your name in our parking lot. And just remind all of us how good you are. And you are such a good, good God. And sometimes we, we do forget that. And we just think about the daughter-in-laws with cancers and the nephews with cancer and the church members with cancer. And we just think about the uh, stomach bug going around and keeping people a little under the weather. Sometimes we think about these things and we wonder, where are you in all of this? And maybe we're not saying and reminding ourselves that you are a good God, and you are. And so we thank you that strangers will come to our church and remind us, it doesn't matter what journey we're walking on in this life. You are the same today as you were the day you created the Garden of Eden. And you 
just created such goodness, you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we just thank you, Lord, that you have not changed. You have not broken one promise. You have not told us one thing that was untrue. And you have kept your grace and your mercy flowing like a river into our lives, even when we are in such a dark storm that we can't see it. And so, Father, thank you for people that remind us that even when we're walking through the darkest of nights, you are a good, promise-keeping God of grace and mercy. And we are so blessed that you love us. And we thank you, God, for sending your Son to be among us, to teach us more about you, to teach us more about him and the Holy Spirit and the triune God, even though it still is very hard to understand and confusing, we understand a little better since Jesus came and taught on this earth for three years. But the best thing that he taught us, Lord, was how to love you and how to love each other. Help us, God, to be kinder and gentler people to those that we meet this day. Help us, Lord, to take opportunities that you have given to us to tell your story. Lord, I ask that you kick the doors down of fear and, and um, uh, being not brave enough to, to tell the story to those that need to hear it the most. God, we are ready for revival for this nation. We are ready for a great awakening. And we know that we can do that one person at a time. And so we pray, Lord, for you to send someone our way every day this week. Give us one person we can pray for. And then maybe that one person will, will come to love you or, and, and either support our church or another church. But the most important thing is, Lord, help us to get your word out. Many people have um, forgotten the comfort and the joy they find in fellowship with other Christians on Sunday morning. Help us, O oh God, to be your hands and feet and to have the courage that you and your disciples had to go out and to tell your story. Lord, we lift up all among us that are sick, that are lonely. We ask, Father, that you forgive us our sins, sins that we have forgotten, but we have not been forgiven for, sins that haunt us day and night. Help us to understand that when we've lifted this sin to you and ask you to forgive us, and we have repented and turned away from that sin, that, it, that it's over that you have forgotten about it. Help us to put that on the back plate and it not haunt us every day. Father, there are some prayer requests and concerns that we can only share with you. And so in this moment, God, we lift up our personal petitions and needs of forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now, Father, as we have come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we join together as your children one of the most sacred lessons that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him to teach him how to pray. And he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we will respond to temptation, for deliver us from evil, for God. And now, uh, sure, we'll come.
come forward. Father God, we ask that you open up our hearts as we give our gifts back to you, that we give them back joyfully. Amen.
Good morning. Um, it is great to be with you. Uh, I think there's been a, at least a couple times since I retired uh, in 2016 uh, that Beverly has asked me to come over and I've told her, you know, when I can help you, let me know. And I'm glad to help her today when she hasn't had a, 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 a really well week. And glad that I could come and help you this morning, Beverly. Um, Karen, my wife Karen and I, um, Karen is a member of Mount Mitchell UMC over at Kannapolis and that's where we've been attending since I retired in 2016 after, uh, after years of pastoral ministry in the Methodist Church. And, uh, but Karen and I cherish Beverly and David's friendship and our connection with Mount Mitchell. Um, but it's great to be with you here today. Uh, Karen and I enjoyed your Founders Day uh, celebration a couple weeks ago. We, uh, we were kind of overwhelmed by that. Uh, it was, I, I knew it was going to be great. It was just, I think David or Beverly said it was one of the best ones you'd had uh, as far as number of people. It was really great. And but Karen and I enjoyed the pinto beans and cornbread and desserts here. And, and all, you were all like busy bees working uh, to make that possible. But we enjoyed the Founders Day here. Um, so it, it is great to be with you, back with you again here today to to share from God's Word. And so, uh, before I do that, let me just call pause for just a brief prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for the beauty of this time to gather here in this beautiful village of Gold Hill. Um, many precious hearts here, uh, great influence of the church, this church upon this community. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Now bless this day and bless all that happens for the glory of your name. Um, bless Beverly that she'll have a better week uh, health-wise. And uh, just thank you, God, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to focus today uh, for a few minutes upon this text that Beverly read from Luke 10. Very short text that I'll be commenting on as we go along. Um, I want to focus today on uh, what, once you read the text, the obvious theme, sitting at his feet, sitting at his feet, at Jesus' feet. Many of us uh, live in what I would call a workaday world where many expe expectations are, are placed upon us. And even in retirement, uh, we find uh, sometimes more than we can do. Uh, in, even in retirement, uh, things that, that occupy our time. But thinking about those years of, of career work, and, and you all can uh, relate to this, depending upon the kinds of jobs we have had or have, uh, there, there may be production schedules, uh, standards of performance, goals, and on and on. These serve to keep us on track and even push us to do more. Now, while my work as a pastor over the years involved uh, many expectations, um, I like to recall the days when I worked at Haynes Hosiery in Winston-Salem. It was my first job after college. At that time, I did not know I was going to enter into the ministry, uh, answer that call that came in the next few years. But I did begin my career uh, after college at, Hi at Haynes Hosiery in Winston-Salem. And... I was there five years before I answered the call to ministry and, and began that process in 1980. There were many days when I worked there at, at Haynes Hosiery that I, I enjoyed my work, which involved making sales projections, uh, analyzing reports, and, and so forth. But then there were those days when we might receive a call uh, literally from upstairs for a certain project to be done we would say, when do you need this? And sometimes the answer was, we needed it yesterday. Of course, we didn't know yesterday. They're just telling us today that we needed it yesterday. So for the next two or three days, we work really hard, long hours to get the job done. I remember many of those situations. I'm sure you have many such stories to tell of of hectic days in the workplace. I might also add that, as we all know, there's much modern technology for the purpose of making us more efficient in order to get more done. Okay. Now, when our work day is over at the workplace and we come home, or, or if, as it has been the case since COVID, many work home 
uh, may still work from home. Yet when that work day is over, there's many other tasks that we, that we have. Maybe helping the children with the homework, meals to prepare, house and lawn work to do, bills to pay, meetings to attend. And sometimes we wonder, when will this busyness of this day end? And then we hear Luke tell about this episode in Jesus' travels as he enters the home of Martha and Mary in the little town of Bethany, not far from Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem. We wonder what to make of this brief story. It helps somewhat to see the impact of this story to just consider the context in which it comes. Uh, Luke 10, uh, quite a, a long chapter, uh, and there are a couple of uh, really involved stories I won't get into, but just to make note of what precedes this little brief story at the end about Martha and Mary and Jesus. Uh, Jesus has the calling of the 70, sending out by, in pairs to minister ahead of him, places that he will go. He sends them out ahead of him, these 70. And, and there's quite a lot happens, quite a, a lot of detail in the scripture about them going, coming back, telling Jesus what they had done. Then we come to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, quite an involved story. Jesus encountering uh, uh, this lawyer who, who wants to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. And, and after Jesus has him to tell and he speaks about the love of God and the love of neighbor, Jesus begins to focus on neighbor. Well, well, no, he begins to focus on neighbor. Who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells this beautiful story of the Good Samaritan, quite involved about God's love, love for God and neighbor love. Then we come to this brief passage at the end of the chapter. It's like things slow down a bit. Things are not quite as busy, although it's very hectic inside the, the home of Martha and Mary. Um, Jesus heads toward his destiny. He's heading toward his destiny in Jerusalem where he will suffer the agony of the cross. And, and on, on his journeys, he enters then the home of Martha and Mary. Now, these women, along with their brother Lazarus, had been friends of Jesus. It was not uncommon for him to, to be a guest in their home. But Jesus coming, the, the event of Jesus, perhaps others with him, disciples with him, and, and he enters into their home, and, and this starts a busy ordeal. Uh, it was the custom of the day, as it is still somewhat uh, custom in our day when you have uh, company over, especially friends and family, oftentimes it, it centers around a foc the, the focus is a meal, meal time. And, and so Martha is, Martha is so busy getting ready for the meal that they will serve Jesus and, Jesus and the other uh, companions with him. So she's busy working, doing what she's, it's traditional for her to do this, the chores of the home, getting the meal prepared. But here's Mary Envision this, Martha scurrying around, busy, uh, just here and there in the, in the household, trying to get things ready. And here's Mary, sitting quietly at the feet of Jesus, listening to him teach and speak. Well, uh, Martha's not too happy about this. Uh, she's distracted, as we're told, by many tasks. So she comes to Jesus and really kind of... Um, uh, 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 scolds Jesus a bit and says, Lord, do you not care? Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her then to help me. She kind of gives a command to Jesus. Tell her to help me. Sounds like sibling rivalries today sometimes. Please don't let me do more than my sibling is doing. And so Jesus she, she, she mildly scolds Jesus, and then Jesus gently rebukes her. That's just so wonderful how Jesus would relate to people. He could gently rebuke someone, but yet he could put them in their place. So he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Robert R. Kopp, Kopp, a Presbyterian minister, paraphrased the Lord's response to Martha's words like this. He said, Chill out. 
chill out, Martha, and concentrate on what's really important. That's what Jesus seemed to be saying. And our response to this might be, well, I know that God is important. Spending time with Him is important. But there's so many things in our world, in our daily lives, that, that we deem as important. Remember, I spoke to you a while ago about our workaday world uh, with so many busy schedules. Listen to what the late Paul Tillich, a, a theologian, said a long time ago in a message entitled, The New Being. The New Being. He said, and I quote, There are innumerable concerns in our lives which demand attention, devotion, passion, but they do not demand infinite attention, ultimate passion. They are important, but they are not ultimately important. End of quote from Paul Tillich. I believe Jesus was trying to tell Martha that our relationship to Him, our spending time with Him, listening to Him and His Word was what was and is ultimately important. Now let's take a few moments and think about Martha and Mary. First Martha. I think it can be said that many of us are like Martha. I saw some Martha's on, foundation, on Founders Day here. Many of us are like Martha. I know I've played her role many times. I'll share a particular story in a few moments. But first let me say that I must be cautious here because we need Marthas who are willing to serve in the church and community. Now this is charge conference season and I know as a pastor uh, that's one committee that the pastors are put in charge of, the nominating committee. And we need, always need more Marthas than we can find, it seems, on the nominating committee for the church offices. Marthas are important. Marthas are so important. Her problem was not that she was a doer willing to serve, but that she became distracted from what was ultimately important. She became so caught up in her busyness that she forgot the real significance of the event of Jesus coming to her house. In her house was the one who had the words of life, but she was too busy to recognize that on that day. When I was a student at High Point College, and I'm kind of dating myself here a little bit because this has been for some years now High Point University, but when I was there, it was HPC, High Point College, in the early 70s. And I became involved in the activities of the SCA, short for Christians for Students for Christian Action on campus. This organization was a kind of an umbrella uh, for the Christian events and activities that took place on campus to, to, uh, to relate to the students there and, and the faculty. In my junior year, much to my surprise, I became the president of the SCA through a, an election. Nobody twisted my arm to do it. It was, it was an election. So then I, I had to do it. Later on in some planning sessions, we tried to think of ways we could be more involved in student life on campus. One thing we decided to do was, call, was to do some what we call coffee houses on weekends to give students something to do. We thought this would be a good way to reach out, particularly to the students that perhaps did not profess the Christian faith. So we planned these coffee houses to include refreshments and some kind of entertainment, such as a movie or, or someone to sing. It, it involved much planning and hard work. We had to work with the cafeteria to get refreshments and, and, and everything lined up for the event. And we had to have planning ahead for entertainment. I remember one weekend I became caught up in with all the preparations for the, for the setting up the coffee house on that Saturday evening. I was working hard to get everything done and feeling that I was doing a good job until a couple of my friends made a statement that kind of bursted my bubble. And I'm glad they did. They kind of reeled me in. 
They were discussing the need to have time during our coffee house that evening to, to uh, allow those who wanted to, to, to share their faith, to have some faith sharing. I was so busy doing everything else that I did not think about the opportunity we would have to share our faith with others who would come to the coffee house. I was like Martha. I was like Martha. This can happen to us in the church, in the community, in our world, in our families. We become so busy and caught up in, in, the, in the plans we make that we sometimes forget the real significance of what um, we are trying to accomplish as a church. As I said a few moments ago, we need, we need Marthas. We need them in the church. We need them to help us in the ministry of reaching out to the needs of the world. Marthas are so very important. But I'd like to add this. We Marthas need to be like Mary. We need to be like Mary. And I've learned that even more in retirement. Um, I've always tried to have a devotional life. But since retirement, it seems to be even more precious. Um, it's just having that daily time with Jesus, kind of sitting at his feet. What was, Mar what was Mary like? I, I, would, I would describe her as a simple young woman who when she saw and heard Jesus speak, knew somehow that, that he had the words of life. She recognized him as Lord, and, and she gave her undivided attention to hear, hear him and learn from him. Now, what was it like to sit at Jesus' feet? I don't think any of us exactly know what that would be like. I'm not exactly sure, but I know it must have been wonderful to sit at Jesus' feet. And even today, as I said, in our daily devotional times, it, it can also be wonderful if we just focus and and kind of look at the role of Mary and, 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 and not let the role of Martha distract us away from that. Um, some years ago, in an appointment I had, um, there was a man named Bernard. And he was a, re was a retired businessman. Uh, he had run some business, and over the years he was a manager. Um, he was quite frank, and, frank, and at times... Um, he could be a little intimidating. He intimidated me a few times, more than a few times. Uh, in business meetings, he would always bring up the discipline, and he'd bring up this and that, and I always tried to follow it, but it seems like when Bernard would bring it up, it was intimidating. Are we following everything that we need to do? But then Bernard shared with me something happened one Sunday that I was not there when uh, a, lay, a lay speaker from the congregation uh, named John, uh, and gentleman even older than Bernard. And, and Bernard had to tell me what John did that Sunday morning when I was not there. He says, Steve, and here's this Bernard, again, get this individual. He's kind of gruff. He's intimidating. Um, you kind of don't know what to expect when you're around him. You're kind of a little bit on edge. But Bernard told me, he said, Steve, I want to tell you what John did when he, when he shared the message with us on this Sunday. You weren't there. He said, John just simply told us biblical stories. That's all he did. He just told us biblical stories. And Bernard said, Steve, it was wonderful. And that touched my heart. He said, it was wonderful. He just told biblical stories and it touched Bernard's heart. That must have been it, what it's like to sit at the feet of Jesus, even in our day. Let me share one other story. Um, I've been blessed over the years of ministry twice to be able to go to the Holy Land. First time was in 1993. Um, it was a conference trip, conference sponsored trip. Um, they were trying to get pastors who served rural churches uh, to uh, have an opportunity to go. And, and I was serving a rural charge at the time. And, and so they called my name. And it was a, a trip for the ministers and their spouses to go on to the Holy Land. And because we were ministers, there was going to be an extension. The basic Holy Land trip is like seven days once you get there. It's the classic basic trip, seven days. 
But they added three more to our trip. It would be a 10-day trip because the end of the last three days would be a preaching seminar. Now, uh, ministers and spouses, but Karen... Uh, did not go because we had small children and she was not going to leave the small children. So she stayed, she stayed behind. Later on in 2014, we were blessed that we could take that trip together with some people from our church at that time. But in this first trip there in 93, on the last day of our trip on, in this preaching seminar, our leader, Dr. Strobe, who was a United Methodist minister from, from the States, took us to a very special place which had been excavated only recently. Now, the Holy Land is such an ancient land, and they continue to excavate and define archaeological digs and things that add to the biblical knowledge and culture of the day. So here in 1993, Dr. Strobe told us this place he took us to had only been excavated in recent years. It was on the south side of the old city of Jerusalem, south side of the Temple Mount. It was a place where in ancient times people could approach the temple area. What had been recently excavated was a place called the Steps of the Teacher. The Steps of the Teacher. Dr. Strobe told us that Paul taught on these steps. Now, th these were not just like narrow steps leading into a building. and about, I mean, the width of the steps, not just the steps themselves. But if you can envision, these were wide steps, you know, a hundred or more feet wide, uh, probably uh, multiple hundreds of wide. And, and even the, the steps themselves were, were, were wide as you step up. They weren't narrow steps. Um, and uh, I think I remember that Herod, when he did the rebuilding of the temple, he, he made the steps where some were... were uh, uh, wide and stepping, others are short. So when you approach the temple, you had to slow down. And, and the point was, you're approaching the Lord. Slow down as you go up these steps. But it was a wonderful place for day, people in that day, in those ancient days, to, to gather a few people around, a rabbi, a teacher, gather your students around you, and teach on those steps. Paul would have done that, said Dr. Strobe. And then he said, Jesus would have come here also, and he would have taught here also. Because we know Jesus taught oftentimes daily in the temple when he was in Jerusalem. Dr. Strobe told us something that just amazed us. Um, I think Neil Armstrong, to those of us in my generation, quite a common name, Neil Armstrong, the, I think the first man to step on the moon as an astronaut. Um, he said that Neil Armstrong came to this place, the steps of the teacher, on a journey to the Holy Land. And he said that Neil Armstrong said that it was more special for him to stand on these ancient steps than it was to stand, as he did years earlier, on the moon. What a statement. It was special to... to uh, Neil Armstrong because Jesus would have taught here on these steps of the teacher. This astronaut, former astronaut, astronaut knew what was of ultimate importance in his life. He's been to the moon, stepped on the moon, walked on the moon, but he knows what is of ultimate importance in his life. That was the most special place he had been there in Jerusalem, the steps of the teacher. Mary knew what was of ultimate importance in her life. Do you and I know what is of ultimate importance in our lives today? I hope we all do know this. It, it goes without saying that, that we live in a world today full of tension and strife and fears and terror and economic crisis and just on and on. We're experiencing it in the world around us. We experience it at the workplace. We experience it uh, sadly in the church today. We experience it in so many places. We really need to be able to come to the feet of Jesus and just take quiet moments and listen to Him. To kind of draw us into that place where we need to gain the strength we need to face each day in these challenges. I want to conclude by saying that 
we need to be like Mary and in a sense sit at the feet of Jesus as we worship, as we Bible study, Bible Sunday school or Bible study or perhaps in our homes as well. We need to find times to sit at the feet of Jesus. As we do so, we sense His peace. And we so much need that peace in these trying times. But we also become empowered through the Holy Spirit present. Christ present in the Holy Spirit. We become empowered to be of service in His kingdom and, his, and disciples in the world as Beverly shared, sharing with someone about Christ, about the story, sharing in someone's life in a way that, that perhaps then they can go and share with someone else, being disciples in the world. So today, let us look at this brief story, but see how profound it is that then and today we need to sit at the feet of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
coming today. Thank you for everyone, David, for this invitation to be here. Um, may God bless you. And let us bow. Gracious Father, go with us now as we enter into the world, um, as we seek to continue to serve you wherever we are. And help us, God, every day and in different kinds of ways to find time to sit at the feet, to sit, Lord, at your feet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.